Hello everyone and welcome back to Is It Peak? Today we are discussing the penultimate episode of Better Call Saul, Waterworks. I'm your host Marcus and joining me for this episode is Johnny Cooper. Hello everyone, Johnny Cooper here. We also have Imperfect Dan. I trusted you, bro. We also have Rez. I just woke up from a really long nap. And we have the return of Cinnabad. Hello, I'm back. Well, before we go any further, as usual, we need to shout out the HN Films patrons. So special thanks to the Ultimate Fanboys, Fartsom, Lyra, and Bill, and our epic fanboy, Rhombus. So shout out to all of those wonderful people. So, what is everyone's thoughts on this episode? Amazing. Ray needs your Emmy. This is the most depressing episode I've seen in a long time. It had everything I've been wanting, you know, the depressing the shit, plus things I didn't even think they'll bring up again. And of course, Vince giving us the most keynote shots of all TV. Uh, he really brought, uh, he really entered and made one of the best episodes of the show. Probably the best episode of the season so far. Yeah. It's, it's a potential front runner. Yeah, it was a pretty spectacular episode all around and it's been giving us everything that we've been wanting you know answering a lot of questions bringing up new ones uh i think aside from one thing this would probably be my favorite episode <laughs> what could that one thing be yeah there, there was some parts of this episode mainly one part that like utterly fucking shocked me yeah and i mean it kind of feels like we have no idea what the trajectory is going to be for the finale right i mean it's felt that way for the last couple episodes but yeah this one in particular um definitely the granite state comparisons are valid because both of them are like considered or this one's considered like one of the more depressing episodes of better call Saul. granite state is also considered like the most depressing episode of breaking bad heading into the cold open of this episode it is soul bouncing a ball against the wall which was obviously flashbacks to when he was working at cc mobile remember that epic plot and uh francesca is on the phone of him very annoyed because he hasn't he's just been sitting in his office for like well like an hour or something you can tell like saul is anxious in this opening he's been thinking of how to like approach kim after not seeing her for a few months uh which the writers confirmed the divorce scenes take place the same year uh season five and six happened so saw changed like his whole alpha like his whole office look and logo to match that of like brba in just a couple of months well yeah i'm assuming that um soul scene from fun and games is probably just like pretty soon before this scene I mean, I heard that the Fun and Games ones takes place uh, a year before Breaking Bad, and this one takes place uh, uh, the same time as season... Uh, I, I don't think anyone time. really knows when that takes place, but I guess it doesn't matter. Peter Gold said it doesn't matter. But yeah, then he opens up his little package, and it is the divorce papers from Kimberly herself. Yeah, I thought they'd skip over that, so I was surprised they actually tackled that. We did know that he was divorced by Breaking Bad, I think, because he does like mention having ex-wives but i don't know bob odenkirk you know it's so easy to praise him but even for like the little things like in this scene where you can kind of see his mannerisms he kind of steals himself and puts up a wall before uh francesca sends kim inside yeah and, and we finally get the purple joker suit from the posters but it's like a variation of it yeah it doesn't it's not the exact same but it has the purple yeah and is this like the first time it's rained during breaking bad such medical soul uh i can remember maybe. i'm trying to think of another example yeah i think this, i think this might be the first time there's a uh, rain in the whole breaking bad universe okay so after the intro we get what we've been waiting for kim post breaking bad in florida now i think we all figured she was going to look a bit different but was anyone expecting a uh, brunette with bangs nope no but yeah kim's living in her florida house or whatever and she has a that's her boyfriend right they're not married yeah it's a boyfriend because at the end he just drives away what do you mean? Like he leaves he leaves her house. They don't live together or anything. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, she's just living like that suburban life, I guess. Yeah, they did feel a little like jarring, I guess. Just to see the, the black and white mixed with like uh you know, the scene of the like house party, like how the women and the men are kind of segregated with each other. And during that scene they were playing that uh Pina Colada song which Jimmy sang back in season two when he was trying to convince like the teachers at the school that he was trying to film on. Yeah, what a nice callback. Quite a lot of callbacks in this episode. True. Yeah, Kim has changed. You know, uh, she's no longer the Kimmy we're used to. You know, she had every. Uh, she hides everything Wexler like, and 
is now your typical average. It's kind of good that you mentioned that she's hiding everything because like even down to the fashion, she's wearing like we see her wearing jean skirts multiple times. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like something Kim Wexler would wear. Yeah, everything's just strange. And including her uh, sex life. Yeah, it's kind of shitty now. Well, we, 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 assume, we assume it is. Maybe she really likes that. No, man. Jimmy would be slobbering on the feet and everything and satisfy her. Yeah, uh, the show has never given us a actual, I think, sex scene with Jimmy and Kim, right? We see, like, the prelude to it, and then we see the aftermath, and we also season see... Season 5 was, like, the only season that actually had that. But, I think we yeah, also but... see them, like, starting to have sex in the background during the Sand mm-hmm. Recall in uh, Planet of Execution. Uh, I don't think it was anything like this one, though. I think this one's kind of kind of different, you know? Yeah, I don't uh, think we've seen any straight soul pound and cheeks. You know, it's some it's, it's with someone that's not our protagonist, but instead of it's a guy who looks like Ken wins. Yeah, do we even do we even know what his name is? Does he have a name? I thought it looked like Ken. Also, it was really weird. I guess the theme of uh, seeing Kim's new life is that she isn't as much of a uh, an active character compared to like how she used to be. Well, yeah. For this episode, you notice she never like makes a decision for herself really until the confession thing, at least. Like, there's multiple times where people ask her a question, her like stupid coworkers, and she doesn't give an answer. Yeah, and then the, I mean, I guess the biggest one here is the fucking, the Miracle Whip stuff. You know, everything. She just says some neutral response, like, I don't know, or maybe, or something like that. It's a parallel to when Jesse was in the Todd lab and he can make choices for himself. Bravo, Vince. No, it's not. What? (laughs) There is parallels to Kim and Jesse, but not that. Yeah, and she, like, goes off to a shitty job. At, well, I assume it's shitty. It looks kind of lame. It could be worse, though. True. She could be working at, like, McDonald's. Well, I mean, she's pretty... She's making a pretty decent living. She has a decent house and everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's definitely framed in a depressing and shitty way, you know, regardless of the money. I was about to say, did she get any fulfillment from, like, this job? Like, I mean, probably not, because her fulfillment before was, you know, from genuinely helping people in the legal system. Yeah, she's unable to do the uh, the work she loves because of the guilt that's been holding her down since 2004. You know, just living a normal, boring life where the most interesting that uh, the most interesting thing that's happened to her uh, in months is probably changing the mayo in her sandwich. Um, uh, you know, during that conversation with uh, she's having with her coworkers, mm-hmm. uh, and they start talking about crack. I thought that was gonna like cheesily lead into something like, "Oh, hey, what happened to that that Heisenberg fella?" Yeah, no, same. but you know, it's a good thing I'm not writing these shows because I was waiting for the meth thing. Yeah, yeah, I thought they were gonna bring it up. I wouldn't not mind if they did do that, but like, yeah, I was kind of expecting that. But it's probably better that they didn't. I mean, it would it would make sense, you know? Yeah, it would. Goss- gossipy girls to bring some shit up like that. I assume Walt is still like a very popular uh, person on news, right? Yeah, he's got plenty of four chan boards dedicated to him. And there was also the cake where she didn't care about they were at, she was asking her if want strawberry or chocolate and then she gets a phone call and it's a victor victor st Clair on the line so she like closes up her office she like draws the blinds or whatever wait did she not use his name no yeah he said it, he said it was victor st Clair. yeah but she knew that it was gene yeah well, obviously because it's the name that they scammed it's a scamming uh, name yeah yeah i don't yeah i don't remember that i remember I he remember used he, he used victor like one episode or two episodes ago literally last episode and we brought it <laughs> up. last episode yeah but like how would kim did, did, did he use that with when uh yes when it was kim he or? was victor and she was giselle remember was the, like the thing the scam with I ken mean, where they were pretending to be brother and sister damn i, I was you, just asking jesus I christ thought, i thought you i thought you watched the show. <laughs> whoa yeah, yeah. Kind of, i don't remember speed watcher, dude. I, don't, speed watcher. I, don't, I don't rem i don't i remember giselle i just don't remember uh jimmy's name for some reason or his code name but yeah, anyway, so yeah, she obviously straight away knows who it is, and we do indeed get to see the call from her perspective, and it is not good at all. <laughs> it is. It's like so exhausting seeing Jimmy on the phone, just talking about everything so casually, you know, saying stuff like "I'm still out here, I'm getting away with it." It kind of just makes me not like him a lot. Reminds me of Walt. And the part where he's saying like, "Oh, Frings in the ground, Mike's in the ground, Lalo's in the ground," apparently that's like. Obviously, I already knew all those people were dead, but that's like when it really hit me that like all these people we've been following for this like entire show plus Breaking Bad to an extent, they're all just like gone and irrelevant now. The was it German or French or whatever translation was indeed right with a phone call, and she was telling telling him to turn himself in, and he did not approve. 
even with knowing the spoiler like it was still interesting how they it was like framed especially like after like all he was saying it makes sense that she would respond like that well i don't think the german recording got everything though like, yeah, i yeah, think it just got that part it got like yeah, some yeah. pieces of dialogue yeah it didn't fully capture just how fucking awkward and depressing that call was yeah we well, guess say depressing a lot this episode aren't we what did jimmy really expect from that call yeah, he like calls up, he's like, oh, he got, hey, it's me, you know who it is? Yeah, and it's also like kind of a, not a callback, but, you know, a reminder of the different ways that they handled the whole business after they divorced. You know, Jimmy kind of, as Saul Goodman, he doesn't really recognize everything that he's been through. He kind of hides all of it, tries to act cool and calm and everything, quippy. And Kim's just been really fucking depressed, hiding every sort of semblance of the original Kim Wexler. And it's it's obviously been eating at her all these years. Yeah, and he says he wants to. He said they should catch up. Like, what was he cooking with that one? Like, how was that going to end up? He's pretending to be someone, uh, you know, who's coping with the way he really feels. You know, putting on a mask like he does in the divorce scene and pretending like everything's been great or even better after they got divorced instead of telling Kim what he truly thinks. It's kind of funny considering how people used to always like side with Jimmy, like over Chuck, like back in the day. Like, I wonder how they feel now. Like seeing what's become of him. Then Kim, I guess, has a moment of clarity or something and decides to go off to Albuquerque. When they show the shot of Kim at the airport and the Alaska sign is right next to it, I was like, are we going to see Jesse? Is this the scene Aaron Paul filmed? But now thinking about it... I was fucking scared during that scene, yeah. Yeah, but now thinking about it, it's it's probably like a parallel to the later scene where Jesse's talking to Kim outside Saul's office. Like, the Alaska sign is uh, being there to remind us where Jesse is at now. But, uh, you know, during this whole sequence where she goes to the courthouse, you can kind of feel, I guess, specifically the echoes of Mike, you know, at the ticket booth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, she obviously glances at... When? What do you mean when? When she's getting the ticket for the car. I don't remember. Oh my god. Oh my what god. is your memory, Dan? <laughs> I do not fucking, remember. I, I don't I remember know. I mean, her entering the It was it was a very it was like a five second scene, but I feel like everyone just kind of felt Mike's I guess past presence there, you know? Yeah, yeah. He got replaced by a shitty machine. Seeing the courthouse and like black and white stuff was like really weird in a good way. Was it a good way though? Good for the episode. Was it though? <laughs> fuck fuck off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We should also talk about, you know, there's a specific scene in the courthouse where Kim is looking at another like young promising attorney and it's obviously a reflection of her old self, you know, someone who genuinely like loved to help people. This lady is helping her client put on a tie, telling her what the judge is expecting to see and everything. And it's a uh, pretty fucking depressing. I was really hoping it was going to be Christy Esposito, but it's not. That's why I thought at first. Should have been Aaron. Yeah, this whole scene was like a trip down memory lane for her, you know, seeing others do the job she still could have had and doing what she loved had it not been for what she did earlier this season. I did wonder why she even went there in the first place. Yeah. And uh, it's revealed that she went there to submit her confession that she also gave to Howard's wife. I'm surprised we didn't get Oakley, Bill Oakley somewhere there. Or well, that probably would have been out of, out of place if he showed up and was like, what, what's up? It's me, Bill Oakley. Yeah, not, not going to lie. When she was starting to glance over at the attorney, I was half expecting to see Bill Oakley like at the vending machine trying to get some mm -hmm. chips or something. He's still trying to get it to work. And, and then um, after that, it just cuts straight away to the thing I was I don't think anyone on planet Earth was expecting, fucking Howard's wife, Cheryl, at her mansion house. Yeah, because like I was wondering, like, why was she at the courthouse? But then seeing that scene, it like all adds together. Yeah, this this scene was fucking insane. She just have that gives her a written confession of literally every single thing that happened with Howard. Yeah, I didn't expect the show to go this route uh, during the final few episodes. Uh, I mean, I, I was guess... think I was thinking some sort of Howard truth reveal mm -hmm. would be on the cards, but not like mm -hmm. this, and not from Kim. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it, it, it would have been like from Jimmy when he's finally in prison and he's confessing to everything. I think I kind of did expect Kim to do something drastic like this, but I guess in my head it was a little more dramatic, like her just showing up at the police station and saying, oh, I would like to confess to something. I didn't expect her to write this all out on several pages and, you know, the framing of the words. It's kind of a bit surreal to see it all described like that you know since we saw it in these past uh i guess six episodes it was almost like story like the way she wrote it yeah the scene was really sad when she was like uh when kim said that 
he died quickly and um i forgot her name but howard's wife was basically cheryl carol cheryl was basically <laughs> saying that um she they ruined what who he was known as like you know part of me was thinking that cheryl got up from the chair and that she was going closer and closer to like fucking claw kim's face or something i don't know yeah i thought he was gonna clock her too she should have brought up what about that part where you fucking gaslit me into thinking he was <laughs> yeah fucking... uh, in front of cliff main and everything chad main Where's Cliff Main? Next episode. Probably retired. Probably retired, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, retired. In a hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or maybe he died in the airplane. The main family the main family line ended with combo, so also I guess another thing during the conversation is that you guys were mentioning earlier how Kim is pretty indecisive, giving like neutral responses, but this is the scene where she kind of I guess grasps it. I mean Cheryl asks her, Do you think you'll get arrested? And Kim just straight up says, I don't know, and then Cheryl kind of rebuffs that response and tells her no give me a straight answer you know uh it is pretty interesting that she's still kind of protecting jimmy though i mean she knows he's alive but she acts as if she doesn't know anything about him right now i mean she doesn't know where he is probably but the fact that she has that knowledge and i guess withhold it withheld it a little it still says a bit about her yeah i was so happy she finally confessed the truth to cheryl howard fans took a big w in this episode you know since, uh... i don't think they made a w because she just she thinks that a confession could fit to everything and she's okay now but that's not really how it works and also the fact that howard's still fucking dead do we think they're gonna find that body yeah, I was I was wondering because didn't they already look into the meth lab? Yeah, but now they know that maybe they could put it together because like Gus Fring was involved with it, so maybe like hmm, maybe we can dig around in that meth lab, just dig down mm -hmm. a bit, and we'll find him. You know that's true because in in Kim's eyes, I mean, they probably they don't know where the bodies are, and they probably not they probably won't find it. But with her, I guess you could call it confession. She lists a lot of names connected to this operation, so they might have an inkling, you know, because she's not aware of all this, I guess. I really don't think she'll get arrested unless uh, Jimmy at least gave his side of it. Yeah, the only one to be able to bring justice to Howard will be Jimmy. Yeah, I think he, this is how he's going to redeem himself in the final episode. He'll confess, uh, which will confirm Kim's confession, and they'll both end up in prison, I think. Which Kim seems to want illegal punishment for. Uh, when we finally see her letting out uh, all her emotions out, uh, you know, she, you know, she's... Uh, breaking down you know after spending six years feeling utter guilt shame sadness and embarrassment for the things she did with jimmy that led to howard's death they could also connect this to chuck in the finale if like jimmy did gave any type of confession like who knows what the context will be maybe instead of getting like a chuck flashback like we see him mention his like past mistakes and then chuck chuck gets mentioned yeah, I could say some kind of scene where Jimmy confesses to literally everything he's ever done. I don't think Jimmy is gonna... There's not enough time for him to redeem himself, but he can yes, at least, is. like, realize what he's done. Because he hasn't really sat down and realized what he's done, or what he's been through. I guess I just wanted to bring up that uh, we kind of do see, I guess, two sides of Kim's reaction to the thing, the way that she's been living for the past, I don't know, what was it, six years? You know, she goes, like, a logical route. She types out this long document, submits it to the courthouse, I guess tries to give it to Cheryl in a way to not make amends, but, you know, redeem herself, maybe? I just get this off her shoulders. But then we also see her on the airport bus, you know, letting out this really messy, ugly crying in public. And you could call that, I guess, the fallout, the emotional side of all of this. We get the worst scene ever filmed in all of existence. Fucking, it's just, like, really long, her just sitting there, and then she just completely fucking breaks down that just like holds on it for like what feels like a fucking eternity yeah lynch type like you can kind of see how long she's been holding it in because it's so i guess like you guys said it's feels like it's going on forever and the people around her are i guess a little bit worried about her you see the person putting the hand on her at the end i liked the guy in the background who kept like looking at her weirdly yeah <laughs> personally uh, that scene was pretty clear filler which could have been dedicated to more walter white scenes True, True, dude. Well, isn't there a Breaking Bad character in the bus, apparently? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, Vince Gilligan's wife. She was a some teacher. teacher at... woman. Uh, meanwhile, back up, back with uh, our Sigma man himself, Gene, just broke into Cancer Guy's house. And this scene was pretty fucking uh, wacky. Yeah, after taking photos and, and stealing like all his info, like, why did he go back? He got greedy, I guess. He wanted more. It's really weird how sloppy... I mean, not weird. It's kind of expected. He's kind of in a, a bit of a dark 
bit of a dark phase right now, but he's very sloppy. I mean, he's he, they spent all this time last couple episodes setting up these meticulous planned out scams where they leave no evidence behind. And you know, we just see him break a glass panel on this guy's door. And when he gets all the information, he just decides to go upstairs and take physical things that this guy will definitely notice come morning. Yeah, I mean, like at this point, it's literally just the Walt motivation where it's like he's sh- literally only doing doing it because he enjoys it. And like there's nothing else in his life that he cares about. And he thinks he can get away with it. Yeah. And apparently in the Insider podcast, like Gould was throwing out the idea that maybe part of him wants to get caught. And also, I thought he was going to fucking murder that guy with that um, pot of ashes. Can we talk about that whole scene? Like, it, it's all chill and everything, but like, once the cancer body, I mean, the dude, Whoa. the dude's body, I should not say that. <laughs> once the dude's, <laughs> once the dude's like body disappears, like, intense music starts playing and he's like, oh shit. But literally the second that happens, it starts going like shaky cam as well. It was like, classic yeah, I, yo, it yeah, was the, the fucking, the music and the, the shaky cam and everything. It just felt kind of, it was like handheld, ripped, or whatever. straight from, yeah, handheld, ripped straight from Breaking Bad, I guess. That scene just felt slightly silly to me in a way, but it's not a problem. The, com- the, the comical timing of it all, you know? Yeah, like the way that I guess the guy just wakes up the second that Jimmy decides to go upstairs. And then falls asleep just before he's about to get murdered by ashes. It's pretty It's pretty metal to almost kill someone with their own dog's ashes, though. I guess I kind of predicted that he would get into a bit of a, a physical altercation. But, you know, I think in this one, he was kind of ready to do it. We've seen him have disregard for life before. Like, you know, when he sends people to just uh, clean up murder scenes or when he's like, oh, let's just send people. Let's just send these people to Belize or something, you know. It's just shank badger. Yeah, he does have a disregard for life when it can like threaten his, I guess, his pockets. But I don't think he's ever had actual blood on his hands, and he seemed pretty ready to do that this time. Maybe he was hoping he would just knock him out. He would hit him like lightly with it. But while all this shenanigans is happening uh, inside, meanwhile outside, Jeff's pulled up, and then these cops pull up behind him, and were they just they, so they were just having a break to eat some shitty tacos, right? Yeah. yeah. I find that funny how in the first scene we see Jeff in the show, uh, he's making Gene paranoid, uh, scared if Jeff uh, knows who he is and what he'll do. And now the tables have turned. Jeff becomes super paranoid uh, that he thinks the cops knows what he's up to. So he like drives off, you know, but panics and ends up crashing the car. That scene, I thought at first when he crashed into the thing, I was laughing hysterically. But then I mm-hmm. thought, what, did he do that on purpose to let so to distract the cops so Jane could get out. Yeah, um, but it seemed yeah, like a lot of people say that. Yeah, I don't. But think I think it so. was actually just an accident. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. it was just because he was very visibly anxious, right? I think he's just an idiot. I got it. Yeah, I think he's just an idiot, and I think Pat Healy plays this like idiot very well. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure Don Harvey would have been great too, but Pat Healy kind of nails the kind of uh, you know the anxious, timid, stupid type person that jeff is written as yeah pat surprised. healy plays for ultimate beta cuck but then gene just uh escapes he just waltz, waltzes out doesn't even care about my boy jeff but yeah let's move on to uh the most painful scene of the entire episode uh soul and kim basically getting divorced yeah yeah you can tell jimmy still cares about kim but doesn't want to show it he acts like he's even more successful and busy now now that kim is no longer in his life which in a way is true but he rubs it off on her and then when he asks uh why she's moving to florida and before she even gets a response uh he responds like oh yeah i don't even care you're not important to me anymore i've moved on it's all about the money now which he even says to francesca when kim walks out of the office Let's make money. Uh, it felt forced because it's, it's like not something uh, old Jimmy would say, like, oh, will outright say, um, but says it just to show Kim that, that, you know, that's all he cares about now. It's pretty anger inducing, I guess you could call it to see to see how he kind of treats her. You know, he the way he talks to her, like Johnny said, and also the way when he signs the divorce papers and he kind of just tosses them towards Francesca and Kim's direction. And uh, you can kind of see through their mannerisms, the way they look at each other. They still kind of have things that they want to say to each other. But Jimmy's obviously hiding it down beneath layers. And Kim's holding her tongue because she probably knows it's not worth it. She's talking to a wall. And when uh, Jimmy calls Francesca sweet cheeks in earshot of Kim, I think that's just kind of the shitty cherry on top. 
I will say on a um, MCU brain level, it is, it is cool seeing Kim in that version of the office. When he said, have a nice life, uh, it, was, it was like the low point. Yeah. I kind of laughed. I don't know why. Just because he was not even looking at her. I just thought it was funny. I liked when he was just like on his phone, like looking at feet pics or whatever he was doing. It's like, what, like what, what could he even do on your phone on those kinds of phones back then? He was just, he was just hanging out in the settings app. Looking at the weather. He was trying so hard not to make eye contact. Probably playing Snake or something. Yeah, he's just like me, bro. Yeah, yeah, this whole scene is just sad because, you know, we know he hasn't moved on and uh, he's using the Saw persona just to hide uh, all his feelings. So do we think that's the first time they've seen each other face-to-face since the fun and games thing? It Uh, seems like that's the implication. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and and he was like, oh, do you like my shitty new office? But then Kim leaves and, and Saul's like, oh, who's next? The peak like, of the episode. Em- Emilio. I was like, oh my god, it's Emilio, my favorite character in all of Breaking Bad. And he says some stupid line about how he doesn't newspaper or something. And then she goes outside and... They do the Felina thing. They did the Felina thing where the pillar or whatever just covers the person. 40-year-old Aaron Paul steps on in to give a fucking pretty good performance, all things considered. He looked good, honestly. Yeah, he, he looked so good. It was way better than last episode, Breaking Bad. Yeah. Probably as good as it could get for his age, mm-hmm. yeah. Because his voice got deeper. Did you? Did we all uh fanboyed when Jesse was talking to Kim? I was. I wouldn't say I was like fanboying. Yeah, more bewildered, like man, but actually doing this because the way they were talking, like, oh, we're only going to use Walt and Jesse for scenes that, like, we're going to use them in ways that forward the story or whatever. And like, you could argue this does do that, but also this feels like something that could have been shoved in in like any point in the show, honestly. You know, seeing how like it kind of lingers on Jesse looking at Saul, uh, Saul's office, um, it is interesting that this is Kim's exit to the Saul Goodman world, and this is Jesse's like entrance. So mm-hmm. minus the fact that we're still four years off that. I I will say it's pretty cool seeing it. You know, I got I. It was probably pretty surreal seeing these two characters that I don't think anyone expected to actually talk to each other at all. Um, I think Aaron Paul did look really good and he was probably doing the best that he could, you know, trying to emulate what, 20 year old Jesse. I feel like the dialogue was kind of off, but yeah, just be hater mode activating. I mean, I don't know. The dialogue kind of made me eye roll while I was watching it. And I don't think I felt that different on rewatch, but I'm still really glad we got this. And I'm, yeah, I'm pretty happy that everyone is, everyone's enjoying it, you know? Yeah. I, I think I, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. It just feels more like, uh, like some YouTubers version of what Aaron Paul, Jesse talks like, <laughs> you know, Yeah. I mean, it could be worse. He could have said like 15 bitches and 20 yo's, but they kept that out at least. I'd have to rewatch breaking bad to see if this is like, because, like, he, he really went on a rant, and I'm just like, is this dude, like, high or something? Like, what's going on? I mean, he probably is. I was pretty critical of the um the scenes from the last episode, but I really liked this one because we use the word parallels a lot. But <laughs> I, think, I think they're actually pretty similar where they're not perfect people, but they got their lives ruined by someone else. Yeah, and, by, the, um, by our protagonist. And Jesse got away pretty well, and but Kim got a life she didn't want. Jesse got the life he was forced to have, then he was finally able to live the life he wanted to have. And it was kind of the opposite for Kim. There's still next episode for Kim to drive off to Alaska. Yeah, do you guys think that this is maybe foreshadowing a little bit her ending? No. You can never really figure it out, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, sure. not, I'm not making any claims at all at this point because I just have no fucking idea anymore. Yeah, I think I've been absolutely wrong on all my predictions, except for the <laughs> one where uh, after what was it called 609 where i said jesse and walt aren't popping up next episode that was my only correct one it could definitely foreshadow something about next episode but who knows yeah my favorite scene is still when uh emilio showed up i fanboyed when he showed up uh which is weird because like you know emilio only showed up uh, he was only alive in like one episode of breaking bad uh but it felt great to see like an og from the pilot that started the whole uh you know, this whole universe, the first victim of the um, of the kingpin who Jimmy will eventually work for. It did feel kind of inevitable that he would show up at some point, but I definitely, it was it was just thrown in as it was like a curveball moment. I think, uh, I think the mic scene from last episode is probably still my favorite flashback to the, to yeah, the definitely. Breaking Bad era. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jesse's still my fave for now. Until the Walt scene next up. Until the scene where uh, Kim gets her car washed by Walt. 
That would probably be in the same, I think, ballpark as this scene. Not yeah, exactly. After this episode, this is not off the table. This is this is, yeah. this is a possibility. Not only are Howard and Emilio fans winning in this episode, but combo fans are also winning. You yeah, know, combo, combo gets a mention. Yeah, and he the thing that Jesse's referring to is something that Hank mentions to his DEA cronies in Breaking Bad about how he stole a baby Jesus from a church or something. I wasn't I wasn't really paying attention to what Jesse was saying though during that scene to be honest. Yeah, I think during the rewatch I was paying not much attention to what he was saying at all. I haven't rewatched it, but it's just like really weird. I was distracted at first because it's just weird to see those two characters talking to each other. When you when it shows them side to side together, it's just so jarring. Seeing an exclusive Better Call Saul character talk to someone from Breaking Bad was pretty keen on. Okay, after that, back to Gene Fun Times. Gene's just chilling at his house, doing who knows what. And then he gets a call from Jeff, who's pretending that Gene is his dad. And basically he needs Gene to come over and bail him out of prison, jail, something. And also, and like Gene's like tone during the scene, he's like no nonchalant. It was like really, not weird, but like off. Uh, I think I had the dad voice. I think it was kind of cool. Was he actually, put? was he just putting on that voice for the cops? But surely they wouldn't be able to hear him. No, I think you're right. I don't think it was like a... I think I don't think it was intentional. I think he was just doing it because he doesn't care about Jeff that much. Yeah, I think he was just having fun with it. He liked seeing Jeff kind of squirm. Yeah, and he's probably reeling in the, I guess, the supposed success of everything. You know, he got away with some nice watches and all the information. Yeah, for a second, uh, I'm not going to lie. For a second, I thought uh, Gene was going to put on the red suit from the poster and represent Jeff as his lawyer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My God. <laughs> And Gene calls up Marion to get her to come with him, and I'm a little unclear, like, what would, why, why would he have to do that? Because uh, I don't think he wants to pick Jeff up, you know? I think there's not really a connection. It's also to keep up an image, right? That's yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, may- yeah, and maybe Gene doesn't want to walk into the fucking police station. We also have to take in the fact that he's not really taking it seriously right now, you know? He, he does everything so casually. Like, his phone call with Marion, which leads to him slipping up because he mentions something about how, like... How it is in Albuquerque compared to Nebraska? He specifically mentions that there's no bondsman in the, in Nebraska. So then Gene drives over there and he's singing some fucking song. I don't know what song it is, but it was pretty amusing. It was giving me um, Walt singing that song in Breaking Bad in the car vibes. Horse with no name. Horse with horse with no name. It was it was kind of giving me the vibes of from Bagman when he gets the seven million dollars and he's just oh yeah. yeah. Singing some stupid song on the way back when seven million dollars of cash on the wall. Yeah, and you know, in both <laughs> in both episodes, he's driving back, thinking, you know, he has whatever the situation is in the bag, and then everything crumbles, you know, afterwards after he steps out of the car. Oh yeah, which happens in uh, in the next scene. Yeah, Jane walks in on Marion doing some sleuthing. We get that Kino shot of the the Saul Goodman ads in color in the reflection of Jean's glasses. Yeah, flashback to the pilot, the not pilot, first episode. Did everyone else notice, already notice uh, she was listening to commercials before they... Yeah, 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 I heard I it. It was pretty yeah. subtle, but yeah. Was it, was it subtle? No. It was pretty fucking obvious. I mean, it I was... I did not hear straight away. Yeah, it's a little bit... She plays it to him. It's pretty difficult to hear until he starts zeroing in on it. I heard that, like, goofy-ass fucking... Goofy-ass, like, sailor music or whatever he had to be playing in his fucking <laughs> habit. Do, 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 something like that. Yeah, it's crazy how Jimmy got his start by practicing elder law. And throughout the first uh, three seasons, we see him uh, helping the elderly people out and the people from Sandpiper. And now a senior citizen is his downfall. It's all gone full circle. Yep. yep. Just as some people thought. We're also seeing Jimmy or Gene at another, I guess, frontier that we haven't seen before. Because we see him, I guess, almost acting threatening, you know, wrapping the phone cord around his hands i don't know if he was gonna actually kill it. i don't know if he was ready to go through with it but it did feel like it you know really don't know for sure what was going on there i feel like he definitely was ready to kill the the cancer patient or at least i don't know like very like knock him out i don't know I, it just felt not i don't know how to explain it the interesting thing to take away from this is like how you feel fear but like for like jimmy of all people like who would have thought we would ever get a scene in which it almost plays out in a very suspenseful way like in terms of Gene Takovic, like who who thought that? We would think that with Walt maybe, but like with Gene, like it, it's really crazy to me. It it plays off like in a very like horror suspense type way for me. 
Yeah, but luckily Marion says, I trusted you or something, and that snaps him out of it for a bit. So she can use her life alert. And he basically, he just lets her do it. You know, uh, Jimmy has always managed to convince everyone throughout the series, like Tuco, Lalo, and others. Uh, but here he makes up, like, the stupid lie. Like, he doesn't even care if he convinced her or not. He was just about to jump right into just killing her just because. And, uh, yeah, like Dan said, you know, for the first time... Uh, I was afraid of Jimmy slash Gene, you know, because uh, these episodes have established how he kept his previous traits, but he uh, has turned it into something more dangerous uh, that his old self wouldn't even do. Uh, he's become like more aggressive and unpredictable into, uh, you know, what he's going to do next. It's probably my favorite aspect of like these episodes, just like seeing how much worse he's getting, even compared to how he was at Saul Goodman. Yeah, I do think he, he was for sure going to kill Marion with the way he was holding the, the phone wire. I don't think he would have, I don't think he would have straight killed her. I think he might have just put her on the ground or something so she can't get up. I think he was in the mindset to do it. He was going to do it. I was so afraid of, you know, watching this character who felt sorry for like defending monsters like Lalo and caring about people like Chuck and Kim. Uh, about to commit his first murder after six seasons because he has like no one else in his life anymore thankfully he just runs off and then the episode just fucking ends what's going on next episode last episode finale uh can we talk about the teaser uh we just fucking teaser yeah like it's jimmy's suzuki esteem uh i'm assuming like years later just chilling there and it's all like rusted up and the voiceover is jimmy like i guess trying to remember the hoover max thing he's like just keeps resigning it to himself that would be a good twist instead of like, because most people are probably thinking it's something that's going to happen in the future. That could just be a flashback, yeah. That's what I was thinking, but I don't know. It might be like the first thing he tries to do in like a panic after, like at the start of the next episode. <laughs> that's what I was thinking too. I was thinking that it was kind of throwing people off and it was just him practicing for the actual phone call in the Breaking Bad era. But yeah, like after this episode, ride. yeah, but after this episode, uh, I'm not sure. I do think he goes back to Albuquerque for sure. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, the real question is, what the hell, how is that shot going to be used, if at all? Maybe the cops are there investigating after they get Kim's testimony? Because, I mean, she does know about what happened to Jimmy in the desert. But I, what would they be looking for, you know? I think it's just going to be montages of, like, places we've been through in the Better Call Saul era and, you know, where it's at now. Yeah, I thought an idea for the cold open next episode could be um, just, like, random... Like a montage mm -hmm. of random locations and stuff from the past with like either some sappy music or just no music. Because that's like the kind of weird artistic thing that Better Call Saul could do. This whole run of episodes in the Gene era has been probably the most unpredictable that the show's felt. I really hope if he ends up going to prison, it's on his own volition and he doesn't just get caught. I think Kim is going to convince Gene to turn himself in uh, again. Like, you know, once they meet each other in person. I'm going to make a bold prediction and say we will not see Gene behind bars. We might know that he does get locked up eventually. Well, yeah, everyone's saying he's going to go to prison and it sure is looking like that. But then I keep thinking back to Gould saying that like the finale is really unexpected and no one on planet Earth could have figured it out. He could just be trolling, but at the same time, like, what, what are they cooking? Like, is it an ambiguous ending where we have no idea? Uh, I think if we're going to have to hard lock predictions now, uh, I think I'm just going to go with something generic. Like, uh, Jimmy goes to prison for a long time. Kim probably goes to prison for a few years, I guess, for her involvement. But there's probably still not a lot of physical evidence to keep her locked in bars, you know? I, I would say maybe it ends in a slightly more ambiguous note than Felina. I think it ends with we don't really know what's next but we can kind of guess what's next depending on how we feel about him and Kim. i think the last thing could just be him like on trial like maybe like just before they read out his sentence it just ends do we think jeff gets his happy ending or is he going to prison he's going to prison There's no jeff gets really... uh jeff gets vacuumed does anybody want jeff to have a happy ending yeah i want jeff to run off into the sunset i want yeah i want jeff and buddy to like live on a farm and have like 20 dogs the whole buddy's okay no, wasn't he in the ashes with the cancer guy dude maybe the final maybe the final scene of this will be um an ash like a pot of ashes and they'll zoom out and we'll see that's actually jimmy's ashes oh shit who the fuck would have jimmy's ashes though and then we zoom out more and it's in kim's house Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you should you should write this show all right guys here's another question do you think we will get a bit of courtroom drama i fucking hope so I feel like they kind of have to. I want this show to end in a courtroom. 
there's almost always every series finale they go back to the pilot in some way they usually try to go to the back to the pilot in some way so i assume it'll be the same here so what you're saying is soul is gonna have sex of a head we're gonna get we're gonna get another scene with the twins maybe yeah, it won't end in kids. a courtroom drama but like we'll get it maybe in this episode i want the trial of saul goodman so bad okay here's my i'm lucky in this prediction uh the word chicanery will be said next episode I'm going to say that uh, we're, we're going to get QB and the Walter scene. I oh think my I'll, god, we're not getting QB, bro. You're the world's biggest QB fan, yeah. I think if we're getting Todd, Todd next episode. That'd be funny. God, oh I really my. I really want a Todd this season. Yeah. But it's whatever. They're yeah. going to have a Todd scene, but it's going to be filmed entirely from the neck upwards. I think we're all in agreement that Jimmy's probably going to go to jail, right? Um, I don't want to lock it in, but I, I, if I have to lock something in, I will say sure. All right. What I don't do you think guys that's think? a lock. I don't think. What are you guys thinking happens to Kim? Them. I think that's maybe the point of contention. Kim walks. I'm locking in. Kim walks. No jail time or anything. She lives a free life. I'm expecting something cre- out of left field at some point. Like whether it's the end or before the end, because like I remember Peter Gould saying something like how uh, this finale does not. It feels different than the other finale. So yeah, I am kind got, of expecting- that's what's got me worried. Yeah, so I'm expecting something, maybe not something super crazy, but like definitely at least one thing that happens out of left field. It's pretty surreal that it's all ending. Yeah, I can't get I can't get over it. Literally, the best show ends in less than a week, in five days right now, I think. Anyone want to lock in any more predictions for the next episode? Um, It'll be similar to the Sopranos, Mad Men, Leftovers, Twin Peaks of the Return ending. I think I do want it to be ambiguous because, you know, looking back on it, Felina was kind of, I guess, too satisfying. Oh, no, I kind of I want that satisfying ending. I'll be real. One last question I'll ask you all, and it's a pretty simple one. Does Jimmy turn himself in or does he get caught? Turn himself in. Neither. I just want the redemption of Jimmy McGill. That's all I want. Out of ratings, out of 10. Uh, Rez, out of 10, this episode. Uh, first watch, I gave it like a nine because, you know, I wasn't, the Jesse scene was kind of an eye roll for me. I think I'll give it like, if I had to be stupid and give, you know, those decimal ratings, I guess I'd give it like a 9.5 or something. Uh, Johnny Cooper. 10 out of 10. Uh, Cinebad. 10 out of 10. Dan. 12 out of 10. 12 out of 10. Uh, yeah, I, I'm like Krez. First time I gave it a nine, uh, it probably is a 10 though. Like, I don't think there's really anything wrong with the episode other than maybe the Jesse thing, but you know, whatever. So that's all we have to say about Season 6, Episode 12 of Better Call Saul, Waterworks. We'll be back next week one more time to discuss the final episode of the show, Saul Gone. Thanks for watching slash listening.